Hello and welcome to the Collect Your Life Incorporated podcast. I am your host, Janessa A. Henderson, and I'm so glad you decided to join us today. This is episode four of our season three, and the topic is being a black woman part two. So um, if you tuned in to last uh, being a black woman part one, you heard uh, basically us go through of basically being a black woman and dealing with uh, black maternal health, um, which is still an issue in the United States. Um, a lot of black women are still dying out here um, as they're giving birth. Um, and black women are not heard just in healthcare, like when you go to the doctor and things like that. Um, and just having to fire a doctor and find one. That's basically what we're talking about. Just going to the doctor and being heard, being seen, and not just being someone who's overdramatic. Um, so this episode is near and dear to me. Um, it may be overlaps from past episodes or seasons. Um, but this is being a black woman in education. Um as a student and a teacher so um let's get into it okay so this is part two of four there will be uh two more installments of being a black woman um this is black history month and it was laid upon my heart to do this so um, I am a black woman, in case you didn't know, so I qualify to speak on this. <coughs> um, sorry. So, basically, as a student, I'll go there first, um, because that builds up to where I am now. Well, I still am a student, so I guess, yeah. Anyway, so we'll start as a student. So, growing up in my household, um... My parents uh, put an emphasis on education. Um, it was often reiterated that in education, there's something nobody can take away from you. Um, like literally after our relationship with God, and I think I said this last week, after our relationship with God, um, the next important thing to my parents was an education. Like... Get your heart, get your salvation, get salvation, get your education. <laughs> oh, that's a slogan. Okay. Get, and that's basically how it was. Get salvation, get your education. That's really how it was in our household. Um, my dad uh, was a preacher. My mom is a, a mother, but she was the stickler about education. So... Uh, the long story short, how important education was to my mom and my dad, especially my mom, because my dad um, made, he cared about her education, but he was like, your mom is the better person to do that for you, like to make decisions. Like, of course, they discuss things um, as married couples do and made decisions and prayed about it and things like that, but he put, you know, he said, she's, you're, you're better at choosing because, you know, I, I, you're, you're the one who's anointed in that area. So mom wasn't going for just no any shab, uh, education. Um, my mom went to certain schools in the Memphis, Shelby County, oh, the Memphis, well, in the Fayette County school systems. My mom went to Fayette County schools. Um, and she wanted us to, she wanted better for us. So we went to different schools and, um, 
she made sure like she was in when I say she was an involved parent she was um I remember a time the only time and I say this so much the only time my mom took up for me as a student was I was at um Schilling Farms Elementary School um no Schilling Farms Middle School because it's an elementary now I think but Schilling Farms Middle School um for two six weeks or something but um I was an honor student growing up and um I got a C in reading and my mom was like that's crazy because I haven't seen any low scores for her to have that and she was like and best believe she was on me she was like why do you have a C I said I don't know like I literally didn't know why I had a C so um she talked to my teacher and um and of course this messed my honor roll status up and she talked to the principal and she was like I want to know why my daughter has a C because she's not the student to have a C and I haven't seen anything come home that would indicate why she would have a C. So the principal, they were given some half answer and it wasn't fitting. It didn't sit well with my mama. And she was like, no, nah, they're trying to cheat my baby out of her grade. Um, I was the, okay, I'll get back to that in just a second. So my mom, in turn, she wasn't getting no help. So she went to the board of education and the lady at the board, the district official looked like at the stuff in the computer, she was like, well, I see where your daughter has one low score. It was like a 60. So at the time, a 60 was an F. Now, uh, students um, in my school system where I teach it, that's a D. But anyway, um, so a 60 was an F. And she was like, but that one low score when it made her have a C. And so they made the teacher change my grade to a B because the principal what didn't even look at the grades he didn't even look at anything he didn't even try to look at anything so um they had to give me my honor roll and my mom snatched me up out of their school and put me at the middle school that I finished out at so and she was an advocate for my education um advocate for making sure that we were done you know things were done right by us so I'll go back to where I, where they were trying to cheat me out of this grade. This is where I first experienced, no, this is not where I first experienced racism, but this is where I experienced major racism and prejudice in the classroom as a student. So, y'all, um, if you're in the Memphis area, you'll kind of know the area of town. So, I lived in Cargerville, okay? in the outskirts um but i went to school in the cordova area so from like one suburb like one suburb to the next suburb or whatever but i was really in the country like that's where we lived but anyway so but i wasn't able to go to the same middle school as my brother because he was finishing out eighth grade and i had to go to where we were zoned to go they wouldn't accept my transfer. So I had to go to this school where I didn't know anybody, nothing. And so they saw my transcripts from my elementary. Um, and so that was an honor student. So they put me by ability. Well, I guess they, this, this is what I'm assuming like now when I'm looking back as a teacher. I guess they put it as they're supposed, it was supposed to be ability. I guess the honors class. But I was the only black girl in the class. Um, now, I'll say start start from here. Growing up, I was always the only one. Or it was like one more other black girl or a black boy in my class. But in this particular class, I was the only one. Now, next door, it was a black teacher. And she had all the black kids. It was segregated, y'all. I don't know. And I really don't think I was in an honors classroom. <clears throat> because it was some slower, uh, <clears throat> lower level kids. I'm not going to say slow. But lower level kids in my class. So, I really think this particular teacher 
only could stomach one black kid. But she tried to cheat me out of a grave. If I see her to this day, I'll probably be like, ma'am, you remember you tried to cheat me out of a grave? Guess what? I'm getting my doctorate in education. My third degree. But anyway, um, no, I wouldn't even do that. They didn't even write. But anywho, so that was one of the th experiences of like racism on a whole nother level. Like this teacher knew that I came from like a whole nother side of town and didn't know these the students at all. She knew I was, she knew I was new. She first, she didn't try to build a relationship with me. She didn't try to do anything with me. I was just the speck in her class. And she was trying to get rid of me. She was trying to sabotage my education by giving me a C for one low score of a grade. And, you know, before then, I had experienced it in subtle ways. Um, one particular time I remember having on a skirt. Well, I always had on skirts because that's what my... I couldn't wear nothing. I didn't wear pants until I was in in college, like on my own and at my parents' house, okay? Um, I grew up uh, Pentecostal, so um, I couldn't I couldn't wear pants like that. I wore it for band camp and that was it. And it was the ugly pants. So anyway, I remember having on my skirt and I don't, I know my legs were not open. I had my legs crossed, but you probably could still see under my legs. Instead of my teacher saying, um, and of course she was white. Instead of my teacher saying, hey, honey, um, you know, put your jacket over your, your leg or, you know, do this or don't sit down like that. You know, common sense things. She was like, Stop being fast and stop trying to show your legs off or something like that. It was, and I never told my mom this because I know my mom would have been up there beating the brakes off the lady. Well, she wouldn't be beating her physically, but she would be saying something to her with her mouth. Okay. So, um, but it was another particular girl now. This girl had on shorts. You can see all of her stuff, but you didn't say nothing to her. And um, then another time, because I had on a skirt too, uh, this same particular teacher said, um, you just trying to wear skirts so you can show off your little uh, legs or something. Like, it was something so smart and condescending. And it was just like, as a child, I was like, felt violated. Um, and I didn't realize it until like I got older that it was a racist comment. Um, also, I had teachers just be so shocked that my scores were so good, you know, um, growing up. Like, it was just like, oh, we got the token black girl, okay. You know, it really was crazy. Now, my classmates, I really didn't have classmates say anything crazy to me. Um, they liked my hair. Um, I actually had some admirers growing up, like, and everything. So, but yeah, I really didn't have racism amongst my peers uh, that I recall. If I did, I really don't recall it. But with the teachers, yeah, I had teachers that I remember by name. Um, I won't forget, not in a good way, too, that were very racist. Um, then I moved to um, high school and I was the majority. But I still had um, some instances with um, racism um in a subtle way again um and um having to make sure 
that I was fighting for my grade and everything. So then I moved to uh, college. I graduated number nine in my class at Overton High School, the only school of the performing, uh, performing arts in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, so I graduated number nine in my class with a 4.3 GPA, went on to University of Tennessee at Martin, um, which is in a rural town, which is mostly white. So um, I had, I was an English major and I had pretty much been okay with every you know every professor and everything except for got to a certain spanish teacher that was racist so this so mind you let me say this this particular professor had had me as a student for this was my senior year so he had me as a student for three years prior to. So he already knew me as a student. He knew my face. He knew my name, everything. So this particular day, I had my uncle passed away and I had to go home to Memphis and I had to leave early. His class fell on in the afternoon and I was trying to get home early so I could get to the services. <clears throat> and I was telling him everything and he was like, um, okay, uh, something to the effect. And he was like, just make sure, because you miss class a lot, I might have to drop a letter grade. I said, I don't miss class. This is the only class time I have to have, have had to miss class. Now, it was another black young lady in my class, and she did miss class a couple times before. So I was like, I think you have been mistaken with this particular young lady, but I have been in class all this time. And I had to even, and then, but God will give you favor in the midst of adversity. I will say that. Um, I had favor with the dean of the college. Um, I had taken her for a capstone and I had taken her for another class and she favored me. Um, and I also the chair of my the that whole department which was over him, um, she favored me too. I had interned with her, and so um, I went to them about and expressed my concerns about it, and um, I didn't hear anything else from him about uh, dropping the letter grade because he already knew like, oh, don't mess with that girl <laughs> or something like God had me okay. But it was so hard trying to defend myself. Like, it just felt like I was always having to defend myself. I feel like as a black child with most in, in mostly white educational settings, I always have to defend myself and show myself worthy. I always have to show that I am intelligent, you know, um, that I have since and I also do real well I did this I guess I've been doing it my whole life uh code switching like I know how to um I know how to um what's the word I know how to switch it to professional then go back to um slang or go back and that's something that is a skill okay so um I will say like I have to I feel like I'm always having to fight because I'm a color of my skin fight for who I am and show who I am because people don't believe that you know somebody black could be intelligent it just and it's like all my life also I have been told uh, because I used to, I talk properly and I'm able to articulate sentences and words and I'm not just using the same words over and over. I have, you know, my vocabulary, it's, a, it's, it's vast. Um, um, I told by my own race and 
other races that I talk white. And growing up, that bothered me because I was like, how do I talk white? Like I was called the white girl a lot because of how I talk and articulate it. Um, and even when I got older, you talk white, you talk white. Um, and I was like, what talking white means that you're saying that white is the elite race and it is not. There are more educated, highly educated, highly paid black women in the United States than any other race, any other sex ever. So come again? What'd you say? Like it was, it was like, no, you no, that's not the case. But it's like a constant battle. Like because I'm a black, I'm always having to defend myself uh, in the education realm. So as a teacher, um, it's the same thing um, with former administrators. Um, and you know I'm highly qualified to teach. You've seen my scores and all that. I've had to fight that I am effective. I'm not just sitting here on my and I'm still going to training like I'm supposed to, trainings like I'm supposed to. I have a degree in English. I have a master's in education and working on a doctorate. And I still get um, certain people to try to question my ability and knowledge to teach. Um, even students. I've had parents try to challenge me um, because I was younger and I was a black woman because in the same regard, it was black male teachers or just white teachers. I noticed that some particular students will respect those other, you know, white, white teachers quicker than they will a black teacher. Um, I don't know if it's because, and I feel like it's a mental thing because their parents are black and they feel like they can disrespect or they feel like I'm not worthy enough to be their teacher or I just got my degree on Amazon. I don't know what it is, but I'm constantly reminding every student, black, white, red, purple, that I am highly effective qualified, been highly effective qualified, licensed to teach everything for 11 years. So you're in capable hands. You're go if you do what I'm telling you to do, you're going to be you you're going to be all right. You're going to learn. And you're not just going to be prepared for 12th grade uh but for my, you know, for my junior students. You're not just going to be prepared for 12th grade, you're going to be prepared for life. And you're, my seniors, you're not just going to be prepared for life. You're going to be prepared for years down the line. You're going to come back and remember because I made you do things a certain way because I'm not just making you do this a certain way for my own health. I'm making you do this so that you can be a productive citizen in society. So yeah, often like I've had a couple parents, um, you know, try to test me. I've had a couple students try to test test my knowledge. Oh, why do we do it this way? Now, I don't mind students being inquisitive. That's not the case. It's the condescending trying to figure out. And I've had coworkers do the same thing and I've had to put them in line. Um, But I wouldn't trade being a black woman for anything. I promise. It's one of, it's, it's, it's a great, it's a great thing to be around uh, amongst so many beautiful shades and beautiful women of color. Like I am so grateful to be a part of it. Um, but yeah, I have to. It's in education as an educator. Um, I'm constantly having to put people in check about me, about that I belong and that I'm worthy, um, which is crazy, but you know, that's where we live in. Um, and the last thing I'm going to say, I'm currently in a, a doctoral program and, um, I've had to defend myself there. 
um, and I'll give the full testimony when I'm done, but just know that um, I've had professors try to sabotage me, um, and I know it was because of the color of my skin. So um, just know that if you're a Black woman listening to me, and you may feel discouraged in your field, you may feel discouraged in school, keep going. There's somebody that is looking to you. They may not even be black, but there's somebody who's needing you. Somebody needs you to finish. Somebody needs you to keep going. So don't stop. Um, and I hope this episode helps someone. And I'll see you again for the next Being, being a Black Woman Part 3 coming up next week. Thank you.